Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Bryce Weinberg. I'm here in Duke at the uh, Duke Medical Center and the VA Medical Center. I'd like to introduce Dr. Esther Macombo. Um, we'll let her talk the rest of the time after about one minute here. But uh, to start out, I'd like to, I slipped this slide in without her knowing about it, but I want to brag on her just a little bit so that we'll set the basis for this so everyone knows what's going on and the lady that you're speaking with. Um, Dr. Mikambo uh, is sort of a uh, special person that I've worked with in malaria research studies over the last 15 years. And each year I learn something new about her. She's here now because she was invited to Boston to Harvard University to give a special lecture, this Distinguished Harvard African Studies Lectureship, which she gave last week, along with three other lectures they talked her into giving during the time. Um, she's relatively renowned. You can close your ears if you don't want to hear all of this. <laughs> and that she was actually the first physician, the first MD in Tanzania to graduate from their medical education programs. She's the founder and vice president of the Tanzania Academy of Sciences and plays an active role in that still. She is chair of many different groups that uh, work to improve health in the world, but especially in Tanzania, including those listed here, the chair of the Research on Poverty Alleviation, chair of the National Commission of Polio Eradication. We don't think about, about that a lot here, but I think Dr. Macombo does. She's the founder and first president of the Medical Women Association of Tanzania and other things here. I think most importantly for me is that she's been a terrific friend and a valuable scientific collaborator in all of our studies in research uh, in malaria pathogenesis over these last 15 years. She's worked with many of the people you know, Dr. John Granger, who used to be here in infectious disease, and we still collaborate with him. He's at the University of Utah now. And Dr. Nick Anstey, who did his fellowship here in infectious diseases in the early 1900s, as many of you know. He's now in northern Australia, in Darwin, where he leads the research program in malaria and tropical medicine in Indonesia. He's part of our grants in this, and he spends time in Africa with Dr. Makambo also. So I'm not going to talk anymore. I will turn this over to Dr. Makambo. <coughs> and what she's going to do is talk a little bit. I'm not sure I like this advancer here. It's too sensitive. She'll talk a little bit about um, her efforts in Tanzania and leave enough time where people will be able to have a back and forth exchange with questions and other discussion. And put this in your pocket so this will make it easy for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bryce, for that uh, introduction. I wish I was given a chance to introduce you because it will take the <laughs> whole lecture. <laughs> it will take, I believe it will take more than two hours to go through your cred credentials. But it's a pleasure for me to be here and to meet all of you. Um, it's always a, it has always been my pleasure to come over to America and to learn about the great things that you people do. I've been associated with the, this university for quite some time and the other universities like Harvard Medical School and the University of Utah, probably for about 15, 18 years or so. And uh, I must admit, this has been a really learning experience for me and I'm very happy to be here today at Duke. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my friend Bryce for inviting me here. And to thank you all for coming this afternoon to listen to me. As Bryce has said, I come from Tanzania. This is a, this is a, one of the least developed countries in Africa. You all know about that, of course. Um, Tanzania is here in the east, central part of Africa. And uh, as you can see, equator passes above it, which makes it highly conducive for infections, all kinds of infections. 
in Africa. Creates a very good condition. Tanzania is is a, is a bordered by Kenya, Uganda at the north, Congo, Rwanda, Burundi in the west, Zambia, Mozambique, and Malawi in the south, and in the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean is on the east coast. Um, now, this thing, Tanzania, um, United is, is, is called the United Republic of Tanzania, and it's a unity of Zanzibar and Tanganyika since 1964. Since 1964. It has uh, 26 regions, and we have a head of state known as Jakaya Mrisho Kikwete. You must have heard of him. He was elected into power in 2005, and uh, this year, Actually, next year, we are going to have a, a re-election, so everybody is very anxious in Tanzania about who is going to take his place or whether he is coming back. But apparently in Tanzania, we have a system whereby there is a very peaceful transition. Our president can come out within 10 years at least, and they live very peacefully. This is the fourth president we have. The three others are just there. It's, it's very happy, and we take a good care of them. There's no problem at all. Uh, the official seat of Tanzania is now 90, um, Dodoma since 1996, but before that it was Dar es Salaam. Today Dar es Salaam remains principal commercial city of the Tanzania and the de facto seat of most government institutions. Dar es Salaam is a major seaport for the country and its landlocked um, countries. Of course, some of you know Tanzania. Some of you have been to Moshi. I can see my colleagues here, my sister here. I can see uh, some Tanzanians and Kenyans. I'm sure you know Tanzania. It's a land of Kilimanjaro. You can see it here. And a land of many beautiful, beautiful animals that will be seen in Serengeti National Park in the Ngorongoro Crater. It's a land of Maasai. Oh, oh, me, I don't know how to use this thing of yours now. Don't, you have to realize that Tanzania is a very, very, very poor country, so we don't know all these uh, high tech things. <laughs> Somebody has to help me how to do them. I'm wondering, Esther. <laughs> Maybe. The old fashioned way. Yes, yes, the Tanzanian way. The Tanzanian way. It's a country of Maasai. I think you see the Maasai in the televisions, and I'm sure if you came to Tanzania, you'll see them even better. Those are the Moranis. They look very, very handsome when they are dressed like that. You can see the animals, the wild beasts migrating in the Serengeti, and this is spectacular. You shouldn't be told. You just have to be there. You, you, you know, in Tanzania, there's a saying in Swahili, Usiambiwe, uone. So you should go there and see it and believe because it's unbelievable. It's very beautiful. Um, now, as if that is not enough, now we come to the worst part of it. Tanzania, with an area of 945,000 square kilometers, has a total population of about 38 million people. That were the estimates in, 19, in the year 2008. The GDP per annum is around $7 billion and gross national income per capita is 660. Population living below the poverty line, that's a dollar a day. It's around 62%. I'm sure that does not surprise you. Population annual growth is 3%. Adult literacy rate is 69%. Apparently, it has come down during the Nyerere period about uh, 20 years ago, we had a better literacy rate. Don't ask you what, me what happened. Life expectancy for males, 47. For females, 49. Sounds pathetic, of course. And the doctor population ratio is 1 to 33,000 population. Um, 
These counterstatics are daunting, certainly. The health status are grim. In addition to that, the high, there is a high risk for major infectious diseases, as I told you, with the equator passing above uh, Tanzania. All these diseases are common in Tanzania. We have food and waterborne diseases, bacterial diarrhea, hepatitis, typhoid fever, vector-borne diseases, malaria don't even mention. That's the commonest cause of uh, infection in Tanzania. Plague and so on. Water contact diseases like schistosomiasis is very prevalent. And mostly children are affected more than adults. Tanzania is rated among the poorest and, last and least developed country of the world. And the above statistics um, actually give you a clear insight of what this poverty um, translates into. It is a grim picture indeed, but probably not all is lost. Why is it not all lost? Because Tanzania is currently experiencing a period of rapid political and economical change. The process that encompasses both political and pluralism and economic liberalization. For Tanzania, a starting point for these basic transitions was a highly centralized single party state, weak civil society, institutions, and an economy largely dominated by state-owned industrial, financial, and marketing monopolies. Uh, Tanzania is now witnessing an easily tangible successful transformation process uh, at the country's higher learning institutions, which has been conditioned by the nature and magnitude of these changes. The educational and employment policies have had to be adjusted to reflect these emerging political and economic trends. The higher education policy in Tanzania, Tanzania's Development Vision 2025 proposes a well-educated and learning society is one of the five major attributes. Now, the university enrollment concerns overall in sub-Saharan Africa Student enrollments grew by over 60% during the past in the 1980s, with Tanzanian enrollment being the lowest. Actually, we are at the tail, 0 0.01. Uh, this is what it has been. The slow growth of enrollment in Tanzania higher education institutions contrasted considerably with this trend. But the more recently, total enrollment has risen sharply due to a change in policy and the introduction of private investors in the country. Before the law for establishing um, that allowed the establishment of private investors was enacted in 1996, Tanzania had only three universities since independence. Today, 13 years after the law, Tanzania has a total of 25 universities. You can see the, the need that was there, which was there, needed to be bridged. Tanzania today has 25 universities, 19 private and 6 public. Six of these are medical universities, five are private, and one is public. And this brings me to the Hubert Karuk Memorial University that is the talk today about Doctors for Africa challenges of establishing a medical university in resource poor country like Tanzania. I think you will agree with me if I say that Africa and uh, all developing countries, they need more doctors than the developed countries. But you will also agree with me that the reverse is true. That even the few doctors that we are making they are all drained out. There is a high number of brain drain from Africa. But you will also agree with me that probably it's Ill, even better if we train them at home than if, if we send them there to do their first degree um, in the developed countries because that is like a license to get lost. They don't come back to the country. God knows. <laughs> 
<laughs> Some of them get lost somewhere. <laughs> but uh, I think they are all over. Because for them is the opportunity. No, um, whenever they get, the, wherever they get an opportunity to go, they'll go. Doesn't matter. Most of them go to Africa, Southern African states like uh, South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, um, Lesotho, and so on. But some are here in the US, some are in Britain, and so on. And despite the fact that they have to sit for the foreign educational um, examinations in order to be accepted to practice, they will go through the hard way until they are able to do it because they would rather stay here even if it's to change the profession <coughs> because of the problems that they have. They don't want to work uh, in, in, in these countries. And I don't blame them, really. I wouldn't blame them until probably we are able to make things better. So now we talk about the experience. We, have, we are facing the challenges of establishing the medical, <coughs> a medical university, uh, the Hubert Kairuk Memorial University. Hubert Kairuki Memorial University, it is called. We'll talk about the name later on. Um, this is the Hubert Kairuki Memorial University in Dar es Salaam. Uh, it's a one building that covers everything. The first three floors on the, gro the ground floor, the first floor and second floor are all, <coughs> they have the hospital, the teaching hospital. It is called Mikocheni Hospital or Hubert Karuki Memorial Hospital. But the, the, the last uh, six floors, they are for the university. This is a university of health sciences. We offer, uh, okay, we'll talk about that later on. Um, okay, what was the justification for establishing this university? Um, there were many reasons, of course, but the, the most important one was the public demand. There was a really need to have the young people qualifying in science subjects uh, to fit and roll somewhere. At least we didn't want to send out them out because it was so expensive, <coughs> it was not affordable, and it was not very easy to get uh, admission anyway, except for very, very few people uh, who could, could do that because they had the funding. The other one is the doctor population ratio, which has been almost constant. If anything, it is getting worse. <laughs> Formerly, we used to, take about, to talk about one doctor per 25,000 people, but now we're talking about one doctor per 33,000 population. That is the average, but uh, in other regions, the rate is very, the ratio is very high. Uh, ranging from one doctor per 400,000 people to one doctor per, um, per 10,000 people. So, but this is the average, one doctor per 3,000 people. Um, Hubert, Car oh, sorry, I should have finished here. There was only one medical school in Tanzania since independence in 19, from 1961 to 19 to the year 2006, with an annual enrollment of six, um, 50, students, 50 students and an annual output of between 25 and 40 doctors. For many, many years, you can see from 1961 to the year 2006. The small number of doctors from this medical school and the very high rate of the brain drain are some of the reasons why we felt like establishing another university. Initially, the establishment to ad it was established to address training needs of health professionals in Tanzania and Sub-Saharan Africa. HKMU offers uh, this for, oh, these are two degree services, Doctor of Medicine, MD, which is a five-year program, and Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree, which is a four-year program. We also have in-service diploma degree, which takes uh, four years and the certificate in holistic therapeutic counseling, which takes uh, three months only. So in a year, we get like three or four um, enrollments. And so what do they learn in that course on holistic, holistic counseling? 
they learn how to counsel. So with um, the people who come for this course, they are probably nurses, matron for university, uh, for for schools, for colleges, for institutions, and uh, I, I think they, yeah, they. So we teach them about sociology, about psychology, about so many other things. Yeah. Okay. Um, then, what is the vision and mission of HKMU? To educate liberally and broadly qualified men and women to undertake research and provide service to the public. This has been uh, our mission. To be become a model private university in Africa that provides high quality education, conducts research, and provides service has been our vision. The process of starting is very cumbersome. It's not very easy. It's, in, it's very difficult, it's very lengthy, and very expensive. You have to go through these four stages. The first stage, the interim registration, you have to just declare your intention to establish your university. You go there and you are registered. We call it interim registration. That may take two, three, four years before you go to the second stage. You are given conditions, and until you fulfill them, you must not even go back to this to say anything. So you go like that until you get into the full accreditation once all the conditions are met. <coughs> um, the constraints. Qualified academic and administrative staff were very, very important, especially at that time. We didn't have enough money to attract qualified and uh, qualified uh, academic and administrative staff. We didn't have enough money. We didn't have people. And even if they came, we were not able to retain them. Some of them were coming and go out within three months, within six months, because they saw there were no prospects. Uh, they demanded <coughs> very high pay, which we did not have. The infrastructure was another problem. As I told you, we are working still until today on a single building. The lecture halls, laboratory offices, and everything was a big problem. Now, um, beating against the odds, the enrollment numbers have grown tremendously in the first decade. The current enrollment revolves around 560 in all disciplines together. We are now able to produce medical doctors who can manage patients, evaluate information, and incorporate best practices into delivery of care. The current status, HKMU, is collaborating with the University of Utah, Duke, uh, that's why I'm here, of course, um, especially on malaria. Uh, th th these two universities, we are collaborating on malaria. HKMU is actively seeking collaboration with academic institutions and agencies with a focus to research. The current status, uh, support from the Tanzanian government, uh, you will ask me a lot of questions as to how we have managed. But uh, immediately the, this university was established, Tanzania came in to rescue the situation because they, they realized the, the need and the importance. So um, the Tanzania Education Authority, which is a government NGO, gave us uh, money to build uh, this hostel for the students, this one here. So um, against the, build, the big building you saw, there is this one on the other side, which is a hostel for the medical students. And the money we got from the Tanzania Education Authority. Um, but then the Ministry of Health itself, actually we are, we are managing to, to exist because the, 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 the government is uh, giving a grant, full grant to half of the medical students, full grant, free. And uh, half of them are given loan, which they will pay after they graduate. They are given loan. It's a big loan. Some of them don't want it if they have money to pay because this is a private investor. But a lot of them, they take the loan in because they need it very much. Uh, so the, the, tan the Tanzania is giving us the support. We are working together with the, with the government. 
Now, the way forward, since November, we have had like 161 graduating doctors. Uh, you can see here, about 161, Bachelor of Science in Nursing 34, Diploma in Nursing 173, and Holistic Therapeutic Counseling about 135. The current challenge is to sustain our future. The current challenge that we are facing is to how to sustain our future. So we have to study the reasons for the failure and uh, stunted growth of some of the medical schools in sub-Saharan Africa and to try and avoid these problems. Don't ask me how, but we are working very hard about uh, on this. Expansion of the newly, we want to expand the newly built students hostel and teaching hospital and build a new lecture host, halls. Um, we expect to raise the, the intake from 60 to 100. Currently we are taking uh, 75 students, MD students. Uh, we have the plans for future programs. Uh, we, we, we wish to diversify by adding on the pharmacy and dentistry when things work out well. Now, Hubert Kairuk Memorial University faces its second decade with a lot of expectations um, of sustained growth and development. We consider our future to be uh, well assured. Now, what lessons have we learned? What lessons have we learned from establishing this medical university? That it is not easy to establish a medical university in a resource poor country like Tanzania. There are many problems, especially the, the financial <coughs> problems, the human resource problems, the, um, the, the infrastructure problems, and so on. The big drive by the government should be to ensure that medical doctors are provided the space and opportunities to excel in their careers. The successful provision of medical education to Tanzanians and other African nationals has been a lesson that we've learned. Um, the Hubert Karim Memorial University must develop an even firmer foundation for when things get tougher and aid dwindles. I don't know when it is. It has ever been so firm. <laughs> but that's what we think. We are very optimistic, by the way. Um, we believe that the, our philosophy, HKMU philosophy, is that the big discoveries are made by asking big questions, by ask, accepting limitations of our knowledge and by wading even deeper into the unknowing. We believe that we are, we are there to stay, and we are inviting you all to give us your support. Asante Nisana, Karibun. I have had, I have had to cut this uh, presentation very much. Um, I wish I could, give, could have given you the handouts that I gave to to Harvard. But this is almost half or quarter of what I presented there. But I think you have gotten the insight of what I mean by establishing a medical university in a resource poor country, the challenges that we go through. And I'm open for discussions, comments. Let's talk. Asante Sam. Yes, please. So I have a question about your faculty. How many faculty do you have? Um, what are your faculty needs? And then how do you plan to address those over time? Yeah, how many faculty do we have? Skeleton faculty, it has been so. Because people don't stay. Sometimes we are able to recruit people, but they don't stay. Because there are a lot of opportunities now at the <coughs> time that because of so many universities coming up. So many universities in a very short period, they come up. Others are able to pay better. Others are government, and the government pays better, especially the academicians. 
Our faculty at the moment, yeah, I, I, I don't have the, the um, I, I cannot have the exact number, but we, we would have liked at least, at least um, for each faculty, for example, pediatric, OBGY, surgery, and internal medicine, to have at least five, at least five faculty, well-qualified experienced faculty, senior faculty members, so that we can run the programs and run the postgraduate programs in order to produce people who are going to come back and do the same and sustain the programs. So five times five, uh, five times, it's a, we need a, around 20 faculties in various disciplines because we offer only the four major programs. Um, OBGY, pediatric, internal medicine, and uh, surgery. And of course, in the nursing program, the same. Yeah. But certainly, that's our major problem the, the faculty, senior faculty members, is what is our main concern. So, if we had like people coming in for a short period of time, let's say three to six months, in different faculties, they can assist a lot. Yes, please. How does our curriculum compare with the one of KCMC and probably with the one of Muhimbili, uh, our, the public university, because I, I, I was grown and nurtured there, so that, that's mostly what I know. I worked at Muhimbili for 28 years before I went to this university, so I know m more about the curriculum of Muhimbili. And I think the KCMC one does not, um, um, is not so different. So really, w our program is almost the same, except there are a, a few changes. For example, our, our master's program takes uh, four years. Their master's program takes three years. Uh, the, the undergraduate program is, is almost similar. We started off with the semester system, uh, and they, they followed us after two years. But uh, most of what is in the, in the curriculum is almost the same. Our, our program is more um, inclined into preventive services rather than preventive services. Yeah. Uh, the, the other question is about the. Yeah. We, we haven't. We haven't. But that may not be so easy at this point in time because of the. I know that Bugando. Bugando. Um, Medical Center. They collaborate with Cornell University in New York, and uh, they have this this uh, distance learning. They have all these computers and students being taught from from New York, which sounds very good. But that program has to be worked out very well with a lot of uh, good uh, power system, computers, and all those that go with it, which in our place again is not well, so well developed. But that would have been very useful, especially in the basic science programs. That would have been very, very useful. Have there been any models <coughs> of maybe the like recorded lectures or something that doesn't necessarily require like something that's interactive? Yeah. I agree with you. That's something that could be discussed. Actually, I think that that's a very good point. I think it's quite would have been a very good thing to do if we could uh, achieve that. Yes, please. Yes, please. Maraba. Ooh. 
You know, I'm at home here. Everybody is speaking Swahili. Thank you. Asante sana. Karibu. Asante. What a pertinent question. A very, very pertinent question. These people are using the taxpayers' money to be educated, and yet they don't serve the purpose. Yeah, but that's, that's the problem. In Tanzania, as you say, when you are poor, who cares? <laughs> Nobody follows things. You see, because really, this, these people should be followed up and put into task. At least they come and save, because they are given a period of time whereby they, they are bonded by the government. And they should save at least three years before they can even go for their master's programs, live alone, going out of the country. But a lot of them, I'll tell you, nowadays, they just don't do it. And when they are posted to these uh, remote areas, to districts outside the Dar es Salaam, they will never go. That's why I told you, if the, the worst comes to the worst, they will change the profession. But a lot of them want to go and do an MPH somewhere, nine months MPH member of uh, masters in public health, and that is a, a license to move into a into a um, UN body like WHO, UNICEF, UNFPA, just mention it. Almost 70% of those who remain at home, they are heading all these uh, small organizations anywhere and not in the world. So I would have thought now that w there's a big talk about it, of course. We talk a lot about it. We talk, everybody knows about it, and it's a big concern for the whole country. And they tell me, Professor, your profession doesn't pay. <laughs> it doesn't pay. And indeed, you can see, he, he gets out of the world. Within one year, he has a car. He has a, you know, he's taking his child to a good school. He's buying a house and so on and so forth. Uh, why would you blame him? You see? So it, it, it has to be both sides both sides. Uh, when, when the students uh, come to the fourth year, or even during the induction in the first year, I always ask them, why did you choose medicine? Always I have to ask them that question. Why did you choose medicine? Are you sure you want to do medicine? Yes. Why? Money. Money, professor. But you don't go to do medicine for money. And that disappoints me right from the start. So you have to go to start counseling these people right from the start. And that's not what we want. It's money. When I finish medicine, I'll go to the US, I'll go to Britain, I'll open my practice, I'll do this and that, and I'll get money. That's not medicine. That's not medical practice. I don't accept that. You see? and. Um, when these people finish, when they put their hands up, you know, because we still put them through the Hippocratic Oath, and they are there just so naively talking about, you know, I'll do this, I'll do that. And at the end of the day, they don't even do their internship. Some run away halfway without finishing the internship. And then you, you say, you don't want to blame them because um, you want to, them to be somewhere where they're not moving. You see, they're in the hospital. The hospital is so congested, it's so overwhelmed with so many diseases, so many conditions. There is no confidentiality. There is no, I mean, there's, there's nothing promising in that. The, world, the, the patients are looking so much towards you for help.
for cure for what? And you are just there helpless. And some of these doctors, they get post-traumatic stress syndrome. They just, just can't. You see, so it's tough for them. So that's why I tell them right from the first year, look here, young man. If this is what you are thinking, you better not start this program. Because you will get disappointed. You see, so there is a lot that uh, need to be done in the country nowadays. First of all, they have to get good working environment, conducive, good working environment. They need to be paid good money. But also, that's not enough. They need to have good schools to send their children. If they come here, their children will go to Harvard, to Duke, and so on. So that's what, you know, and nowadays, our young men and women are so different, actually, from what, from us. You see, we never thought about all these big things. When you wanted to become a doctor, you really wanted to save a patient. But our, our children are not like that. Nope. You heard my son. It's about money, boo, boo, money, money, money. You see? There's nothing bad with that. But then if you're coming to this profession, it has to be the medical profession for the people, for human. You see? So it becomes very difficult. So to answer your question, I'll say that it has to be bilateral. The government or whoever is employing them has to do their job and the students or the doctors to do their job. That would be my answer. Yes, please. Um, building on the third question, um, are there any incentives that have worked or to have successfully um, motivated or um, helped doctors practicing in the rural areas? Yes, I think the Clinton Foundation is doing it. Clinton Foundation is trying to do that, but this is a very minimal portion of this. Uh, um, the workforce. Uh, they send people to the remote areas with a package, special package, a very good package for that matter. I don't know how far they've gone, but since it started, they seem not to have lost people on the way. But the government is not prepared to do that because it's costly. This is a program, so with the program, maybe if they find it, uh, that it's working, they will replicate it to the government for that matter. But but that's one of the programs that is working. That is working. There's an interesting program I'm hearing from all of my colleagues um, from Mali, Dr. Kume. And there's an interesting program that's been working in Mali and in Madagascar. And the situation with Mali is different because there's a surplus of doctors and nurses that are coming out of the system. Um, but it's, it's a rural doctors initiative that um, provides basic um, community health and communication and management training for doctors wanting to go serve in the rural areas, providing them also with a support network once they're there, um, providing them with continuing education. Yeah, it's a very interesting model as well. They've had a very good success rate with, with um, that's that's it's one good thing uh, one good thing is that the government knows what these people want it's, it's not that they don't know the medical association of tanzania for example they've made it clear about what should be done to make this to retain these people or for them to go to this they should go to these remote areas and um, I mean, if, want to, if the government wants to retain them there, then ABCD would be fine. But for some reasons, um, these conditions are not being met for, I don't know. I don't know why, really. I don't know. I don't work in the government, so I don't know. But it's not that they don't know. They know it. But my, my, my problem is that the doctors themselves, you know, the doctors themselves also should be considered. If we really agreed to get into the medical profession really to become a doctor and you have taken the taxpayers money to be educated then you should be able to pay back even for those three four years i don't think that is too much sacrifice 
and I always talk to them like that, and they don't they don't agree with me. They think, yeah, yeah, you're not right. Yes, please tell. Oh yes. I think it's I think it's very simple answer. Upside down. <laughs> really. I mean it's like this. The change is like this. And it is true I've been there since because I was the first Tanzanian woman to become a doctor in nineteen sixty nine. And so I am in the history of medicine in Tanzania. When we got independence we had only six medical Tanzanian doctors. So I am among the people in that history of the Tanzania. So I have lived and grown with this. Nyerere and um, Ali Mwinyi and Mkapa and now this other man, Kikwete, I have lived with them. And I know all their systems, although I am not a politician, I don't understand, my, but at least you can see. Things have changed so much. During the Nyerere, I wouldn't say it was it was a, a very different thing because we did it blindly for love of Nyerere but probably it was not really fair what we did or what he wanted us to do but we did it committedly and it worked but for a certain period only that's why he couldn't make a U-turn and he had to step out to leave the system continue and the system has continued very faithfully but it has changed to capitalism or imperialism as the America the, the, the Russians call them and uh, but I, I really don't believe that is that's the problem the problem I don't know whether it's globalization or whether it is uh, technology I really don't know because there's such a change that I, I, I observe nowadays I'm, I'm so old compared to the young boys I teach there is a total reverse of what we, we, we used to think about uh, all these professions. Sorry, I, I cannot be specific, but <laughs> in general, that's what I would say. I don't think I could have agreed more with you, 100% plus. <laughs> <laughs> really, you are more than right because I am a pediatrician. You tell my child, don't do what I do, do what I say <laughs> all the time. Don't do what I do. I go this way, don't come with me, but don't come with me, go this way. It's not possible child wants to do exactly what the father them, especially the fathers, they are role models for their children. They really love to do like the father. You know, they want to drive like a father, they want to do things like the father. And therefore, we lack role models. I agree with you perfectly. A lot of doctors nowadays have completely forgotten about the medical conduct, the professional conduct, the ethics of medicine, everything is they have left it behind there. They're just moving, you know, I don't know where they are going. But they are going. And the medical students are following them. You see, this my father is going this one, I go with him. But really, we, ra we lack role models. There are no role, model in, more role models anymore. 
in at least in my country, which I know a lot better than other countries, but I will not even say it's only for Tanzanians because our young boys, it's all over Africa. They will tell you, Professor, I have to rush here and get money. I have to rush. A lot of the doctors are honeymooning, are not honeymooning, moonlighting, sorry. <laughs> 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 I, wish, I wish I could talk to you in Swahili. They are, they are moonlighting. Uh, somebody talked about the Muhimbili Hospital. You see these doctors of Muhimbili Hospital. The, you can go there during the meetings, you will find them. The word round, they are there only for 10, 20 minutes. The best is two hours. Best is two hours, and they are gone. You don't want to know where they are gone. Nobody wants to be responsible. Nobody wants to take care, to be accountable. Nobody wants, you know. And the students do the same. So the students come out of class. They go the other way around. And the students in the fourth year, fifth year, they are doing medical practice somewhere. They are not even doctors because they are rushing behind their teachers. You see, so it's like, I, I think that the medical doctors themselves have got to set the way. If they don't do, we'll never get there. And we discuss about this in our meetings in the, in the medical association, in the pediatric association. Uh, for us women in the medical women association, which I founded uh, in 1987, I would say we have done a incredible job. But uh, that is just a peanut, um, considering what has to be done in Tanzania to change the, 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 the people to, to, to s at least to take the right way towards the the profession. Yes, Bryce. 